to preserve the Hanoks and the larger Pukchon community? Well, by 2002, the number of Hanoks had been declining steadily for well over 20 years. And the Ansel city decided that something must be done to restore the uh, traditional aspects of the neighborhood. And this led to the formulation of the Bukchon plan. Uh, the plan, which I have read, was uh, an outstanding piece of work in which the highest international standards in the way it discussed conservation and preservation. It gave detailed recommendations for how to repair and reserve and preserve Hanoks, uh, about the, uh, the crafts, the use of materials, the techniques, and so on. And so uh, we were looking forward to uh, a regeneration of the traditional uh, beauty that had once existed in the area. But instead, what took place was the steady demolition of even more hanoks. Um, and initially we thought, these are rogue builders and they'll be uh, brought to justice very quickly. But this did not happen. And so I felt increasingly alarmed by this, so I began to write to the civic authorities, the newspapers, and eventually I started a website about this issue. But all the time, traditional hanoks were being demolished, and new concrete buildings were taking their place. I'm glad you mentioned your website. Uh, it's k-a-h-o-i-d-o-n-g dot com. And I'd like you to talk about how it came into being. You mentioned it was a response to kind of a personal alarm of what you were seeing happening in your community. Yes. Well, the, the website was started as a single-page essay in English in uh, 2005. And I started this in frustration after a year of trying to... Uh, uh, make some sense of why Hanoks were being demolished as part of a preservation and conservation project. Uh, shortly after the website w went live, um, some journalists noticed it. I think it was referred to in some of this blog and someone followed the reference up. And this led to an article in a Korean newspaper. And this led to more. And uh, as um, interest grew. I began to add these newspaper articles to the website. Uh, more people began to make contact with me and provide me with information and points of view. And now there's over 3,000 pages of documentation on the website, most of which uh, is in Korean, but an increasing proportion is in English. And recently I was contacted by uh, people in Italy and France who volunteered to translate uh, the material into their languages. Uh, these were people who I'd never met or heard of before. They approached me by email. And so they've started work doing this. And why are they doing it? Because they think the issue of heritage protection is an important one, and they feel that people in their own countries should have access to this story and be able to understand what is taking place. Um, part of the interest, I think, is because by making two Hanok villages World Heritage Sites, <coughs> UNESCO has raised the profile of Hanoks and of heritage in Korea. It's interesting that it seems that the preservation of the Hanoks is quite a passionate pursuit. Uh, both for someone like yourself who's actually dedicated so much of your time and efforts to the to their preservation, but also I think so many expatriate residents of Korea uh, as well as visitors here seem quite um, passionate when it comes to the issue. And I'm wondering, beyond what you just said, uh, is there anything in particular about the Hanok that seems to inspire foreigners and foreign visitors to Korea? Well. I think people are attracted in different ways, but I think one of the key attractions to them is the uh, is the oriental beauty of it, the use of materials, the wooden beams, uh, the layout of a courtyard, um, and the contrast between this and a modern concrete um, apartment. Uh, many people 
are happy to live in apartments, but there are quite a large number who prefer to have their feet on the ground, uh, to live in their own little plot of land. And uh, a Hanark answers that need. In, in England, I suppose the equivalent would be to live in an English cottage in the countryside. So it has a charm of, of that kind. You mentioned that uh, many people do prefer to live in an apartment, and we've certainly seen in Korea, I think since the mid-1960s, the rise of the ubiquitous apartment block towers. And I think that a lot of older Koreans would say that while they recognize the beauty of a hanok, they say that it can be quite inconvenient to live in a hanok in a modern time. As, as someone who's lived in a hanok for 20 years, would you say that there are some inconveniences to living in a hanok? Well, uh, I've lived in both hanoks and um, apartments, and um, uh, on balance, I prefer to live in a hanok. Um, apartments have their inconveniences too. The noise from the neighbors upstairs, the day when the elevator doesn't work, uh, things of that kind. Uh, the uh, hanok has a unique personality to it. It's like a living home, whereas an apartment is a bit like uh, concrete packaging. So. But in your neighborhood, do you get the feeling through your conversations or just through reading or whatnot that there are residents in your neighborhood who would prefer to live elsewhere? All original residents have gone. Uh, some from choice, some because developers put a lot of pressure on them to sell. So uh, our neighbors now um, are the owners of second and third homes and, their, and the hanoks, uh, the concrete hanoks they built are empty most of the time. So uh, there's, a, there's no longer a neighborhood in the sense there used to be in the 1980s. So in terms of preservation, it's more than just the preservation of the structures, but also it sounds like the identity, the feel of the community has been radically changed. Yes, yes. There's, there's simply no um, on comparison. In the 1980s, you had a vibrant community of ordinary Korean people, uh, all age groups. Uh, you had children, grandmothers, um, people who were retired, working people, all doing the normal things that people do in the course of their life. It was uh, also quite a friendly area. Uh, People would invite you around to their home for tea. We invited people to our house for tea. You would lend them things, you would borrow things from them, and so on. It was uh, uh, a wonderful feeling. And for myself as a foreigner, going to a community like that in uh, a relatively new country was a wonderful experience. But that aspect of the district has vanished completely now. As recently as late 2008, Seoul Mayor Oh Se-hoon pledged during a press conference that he would back the uh, dedication of some $300 million to help protect and preserve some 4,500 Hanok homes throughout the city. Do you know anything about the, how that, if that uh, pledge has resulted in any kind of widespread protection for the remaining well, Hanok? Um, a few months ago, two original hanoks in my own street were demolished and I wrote to Mayor O oh to ask him about this uh, and I pointed out that every demolition makes achieving the target he set himself a little more difficult. Eventually I got a letter back saying the demolitions were all perfectly legal and there was no problem with them. So there seems to be a, a contrast between the the public statements, and what happens on the ground case by case. Well, we are basically out of time, but I wanted to ask you one last question. And, and uh, Are you at all optimistic for the future of both your neighborhood and Bukchon and the Hanok in Seoul? Um, yes, I think, uh, I think there are still surviving Hanoks that can be saved if there is the will and support by the people in general, and if the politicians make sure their uh, public statements are translated into action when difficult decisions have to be made. Okay. Well, thank you so much, David Kilburn, for your time and for uh, participating in the interview today. Thank you.